Hello, this is Socially Triggered, and this video is going to be on the psychology of numbers. Um, the COVID-19 uh, epidemic is kind of interesting in one way that we're not really used to. Um, when we have like the regular flu season, actually like millions of people get infected. Uh, and the numbers worldwide are actually quite high in terms of the number of people that die. But we never see those numbers. We never like see the daily take, you know, the you know the ticker of those numbers constantly going up. And um, for those people that don't know, uh, my background is actually in marketing. And one of the things that I often do is I'm I do a lot of social media marketing. And one of the things you do in social media marketing is you create perception. And perception is the idea that if I have an account on Twitter, for example that has zero followers, well, that the perception is that I'm, no, I'm not interesting and that nobody really cares about me. And that kind of doesn't really do that well. You know, it, it's, it's, you know, your messages don't really get paid attention to because the perception is that nobody cares about you. However, if you have like 100,000 followers, well, then that number gives you uh, clout. It gives you authority. And people value your opinion differently and they give you more credit in terms of whether or not what you're saying is valid or not and it's it's, it's kind of a bogus thing but it's something that we do uh, where we have this perception of the number having meaning beyond what the actual person is saying we should actually just look at what the person's saying if they're saying something stupid then we <laughs> we should just ignore it and if they're saying something wise and intelligent we should, you know, value that opinion. So it, and the number should be unimportant. It should be based on the merit of the argument the person's providing rather than how many followers they have. But, but our society has really gotten used to that concept of numbers and that psychology of how much value to attribute to something. Well, the same is happening with this COVID-19 thing. We, we see these numbers and they're constantly going up and they're going up exponentially, and the, there is a real concern there, but there's a bunch of things happening, and we don't really truly understand the number, and there's a psychological thing that's happening where the number is uh, influencing how we perceive the situation. So let's try to understand the numbers a bit in a different way. Um, one of the things that happens is you have what's called test kits, and test kits basically allow people to test for the virus. Now, in the past, if you look at like uh, influenza, you know, a typical flu, well, you, you test for it only when there is a valid concern for it, where somebody goes to the hospital, there's, they're seriously ill, and they need some kind of either penicillin or some kind of anti, antiviral, uh, antibiotic to fight the, uh, the disease. So generally what you do is you, you test for it at that moment. So generally with the influenza, there's, it's about 1%, 0.1% kill rate, death rate. And that, um, but we never track that. We never, those numbers aren't daily released or announced to the world like the way COVID-19 is. This is the first time in our real history where those numbers are being announced on a daily basis and are occupying the human mind <laughs> are our thoughts all the time where we're the media is going on about it it's constantly being pushed out these numbers like now we're at that psychological number where it's over a million cases now it's probably been over a million cases for quite some time we just didn't know about it and the more we test we actually are finding out the truer number We'll never know the real number, but we're finding a closer approximation to what the real number is. But the point is, we have the situation where we are being influenced by this, and it's creating a fear and anxiety. And when people have fear, they're more likely to be willing to take uh, precautions. We're, we're, we're designed to be survival organism. And as a result, we're willing to give up certain things in order to maintain our life. So if we know that uh, uh, 
by socially distancing, by avoiding other people, <laughs> um, you know, doing all these things will protect us, we'll generally do those things. And we'll also be willing to give up our freedom if it means saving our life. So if there wasn't this COVID-19 situation, we wouldn't probably be willing to give up our freedom of uh, just even leaving the house or going to work uh, it, just because the government says so. But because of this situation, we, we almost freely give up, uh, we almost imprison ourselves willingly because uh, of the fear that this pandemic has created. And what we should do is be kind of more logical about it because this is an emotional thing that we're, 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 we're making these decisions on an emotional impulse rather than a logical one. Now, I was one of the first people on YouTube and uh, even before I announced it on YouTube, I, I announced it to my family and my friends that I thought the COVID-19 uh, epidemic, the pandemic was going to be very bad. And I saw the numbers in China and I, I kind of figured there was a real issue there. However, I never advocated for the totalitarian extreme measures that the government is taking now. And I, I want that to be known <laughs> that um, I, I, think, I think what's happening is we have this fear of the number and it's giving us, um, it's making us, I should say, uh, very willing to accept the totalitarianism, extreme measures that the government is basically implementing upon us. And what we should be doing is the exact opposite. We should be uh, exposing our freedom <laughs> and we should be uh, promoting business. Um, one of the things with me is I'm, I'm very pro-capitalist and I believe that um, many minds working on something is better than a few minds working on something. So generally, um, if you have um, a government solution to a pandemic situation, the government solution is to control. That's, you know, it sounds like a good thing, control and, uh, you know, create a system, you know, create a central body of authority that, you know, dictates orders to the rest of the, of the country or area that, of the influence that they have. And basically that, centralized government solution, you know, it starts doing things like trying to control supply chains. Now, one story that I heard just recently is uh, eggs, which is considered an essential service because we need eggs to eat. Um, well, those eggs uh, can't get to market because uh, what's considered a non-essential service is box making. <laughs> so they don't have the boxes to put the eggs in so they can't get them to market. So that supply chain is disrupted because you have the central planning agency, like sort of like a socialist uh, central planning agency, making decisions on what's considered an essential business and what's not essential, essential business. And that causes real problems when you're trying to provide for a whole bunch of different industries, you know, and make it so that the supply chains don't get disrupted and that people get fed. Um, so this is the problem with government control where they try to plan out every little aspect, but they can't see the whole picture because nobody can. It's just too many pieces to see. Whereas if you rely on freedom and you rely on the free market, generally what happens is businesses, they have to evolve very quickly. They, they, they have to change their pace very fast in order to understand what they need to do in order to maintain their business and to uh, take advantage of a crisis. A capitalist, a good capitalist, a good entrepreneur will see this crisis as a potential business opportunity. Now, it sounds really bad to say that. This sounds like all oh, those evil capitalists. But what I'm saying is they, they see it as a business opportunity where they're trying to come up with a solution for it. An entrepreneur is somebody who's solution orientated they they want to find a solution a, a cure basically for the disease because they if they can find the cure or if they can find a solution that helps a lot of people and the more people they can help the more money they can make there's a huge incentive 
whereas the government has the actual opposite incentive. They basically want to control the situation and the more people they can control, the better it is for them. They, they get, you know, they get more power <laughs> and that's good for them. Uh, so an entrepreneur has a very different motive uh, for doing things. And as a result, what you want is you want more entrepreneurs involved. Um, with the current government shutdown, where they're basically saying, no, you're not allowed to do anything. Um, basically, businesses are not allowed to work together in order to solve the problem. And I always found like, you know, uh, two heads are better than one kind of philosophy is very true that you want to have as many heads working on this as possible, rather than just a few bureaucrats that really don't know anything about anything, <laughs> making the decisions for everyone. Also, I, I've noticed that one of the things that they do, especially um, the government, is they have a tendency of uh, relying on health professionals. Now, that sounds like a good thing. It's like, oh, yes, hey, they're, they're going to the scientists who know what they're talking about. However, scientists, uh, especially doctors, they have sort of like this belief that no life should be lost. And what we should do is think of it through an economics kind of way where there is acceptable loss. So if you try to save everyone, well, <laughs> that's impossible, first of all. But also it can, it can have actually extreme results that could actually kill more people than save. Um, because what ends up happening is, for example, uh, many hospitals right now are shut down for non-essential services. And I was just watching Ramsey Paul, and he was talking about this too. Uh, he was saying that, uh, for example, they wouldn't, they don't do mammograms where you know they screen breasts for potential risk of cancer. Well, if they consider that a non-essential service, what ends up happening is those mammograms are delayed, and the delays in doing those mammograms can actually result in death because people are not getting the treatment that they need when they need it. <laughs> they just don't know that they are at risk. So what ends up happening is people actually get killed just because uh, the government has come in and said, well, you know, these are non-essential services and they're preventing the healthcare that is actually essential. Uh, so I, I, my belief is that all things are essential in this case, that the free market is essential to basically solve the problems and also um, help all the people that need the help. So what I want people to understand from the, what I'm talking about here is that we shouldn't be too concerned about the numbers in a way. We should look at them and understand them and understand the meanings behind them. So really understand the numbers in a very different way. One thing that you got to understand about the numbers is first, what happens is this, as you, um, as time progresses, you're going to do more testing. And what's going to happen is uh, governments are going to test even more every, every week that goes, because what they're going to do is they're going to ramp up what's considered an essential service, uh, which is the test kit production. So they're going to produce more test kits. And the more test kits you have, the more people that get tested. Well, the more people that get tested, the probability is more people will have cases of it. <laughs> Just you test more, you find more, just the way it is. Um, so the numbers will constantly go up, just sheer math. The also, also what will happen is um, the numbers, you have to look at it even further. And you say, well, how many people are actually um, dying from this? And the number is quite high right now. Uh, and you would expect that. Because what happens is, um, as more people get tested, uh, the ones that do die, um, like the earlier cases, are probably people that were pretty hard hit by it. Because only the people that are hard hit by it are going to get tested. And generally, what ends up happening is, uh, you, you know, those people that were early on in this in the symptoms are going to get hit the hardest because the not only is 
the, the the virus more virulent at that point because viruses generally don't really want to kill their hosts they want to survive too <laughs> so killing they killing their host basically kills themselves so generally they become less virulent over time so the earliest cases are usually more virulent than later cases so the death rate is a little higher at the beginning than later on this is probably going to be something where we're going to be living with COVID-19 for a very long time because of the fact that um, it's always, it's going to change and adapt and um, it's going to basically try to stay with us longer. So those early cases, you're going to have a very high death rate. Um, as uh, testing continues, what you're also going to experience is the, the following, that um, cases of other things other death, deaths are actually going to get associated to COVID-19 because what ends up happening is if you have a heart attack and they notice that you also have COVID-19, well, they're going to associate the death to COVID-19. Uh, that's a natural medical practice that they, they consider it a, a, an extra uh, um, disorder that, can, that helped lead to the death. Maybe that person with the heart attack could have survived if they didn't have that extenu extenuating circumstance of the COVID-19. So what ends up happening is a, a lot, a lot of the deaths that were just would have happened anyways uh, get associated to COVID-19, and so you get a death rate increase there as well. So what I'm tr what I'm trying to get at here, and what I really want people to understand is don't be psychologically impacted by these numbers. Um, had we done the same thing with um, influenza or other things, we would have seen similar similar numbers. We would have seen this kind of crazy, you know, exponential growth during the flu season, and it would have would have been very very scary. But uh, it's not something that we should um, give up our freedom because. Uh, yes, we should still practice best practices of socially distancing and being careful. Cover your, you know, cover your mouth when you sneeze or cough. Do the basics: wash your hands, don't touch your face, do what you need to do in order to, you know, protect yourself. But don't uh, go to the extreme measure of basically preventing people from interacting at all. And that's what we've done. Um, because what we need is actually people interacting so that they can exchange ideas and come up with solutions that we can do to mitigate the disease and also protect each other from infection, from, uh, from complications from the disease, from being socially isolated, which can also be lethal <laughs> because people are you know, going to be depressed and going to be on Potentially, they might go into drugs. Or they may, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of complications that can come out of this extreme social isolation. So um, I'm hoping that this all makes sense. And uh, it's a bit of a rant. I get that. Um, but I just, I'm just frustrated to see the way that the government's handling this situation. And I, I don't like the, the amount of fear that they're kind of pushing into the news narrative where they're focusing on the numbers, they're focusing on the, the deaths. And, you know, it just, it just creates panic when there is no need for that panic. Uh, these numbers are still very low. Um, yes, they're ele elevated compared to a regular flu season and multiple times elevated, but it's not the end of the world. We still, we, we're going to make it through this. Um, so that's socially triggered for this, <laughs> this day. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give me a comment, like, subscribe, all that wonderful stuff. And check out my other videos. Check out my earlier videos where I actually kind of go into the numbers. And it's sort of following the projections that I saw. I even predicted it back then that the death rate would go up. Um, and I was kind of right. <laughs> so um, check out my earlier videos on the coronavirus. Check out my other videos on other topics. I, I do a lot of other videos. I don't really like to talk about COVID, 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 the coronavirus, but 
it's one of those things that's dominating the the conversation right now and i can't help but be influenced by that so um thank you for watching